Okay, welcome back everybody. Um, we're uh, gonna be starting our next panel here. Um, and uh, this is, will be our final panel for the day. Um, I've got a couple administrative notes to read first and then we'll get right into it. So before we begin our session, I have a couple of announcements to make. Um, first, we request that you don't take photos, video screenshots or recordings of today's session. Second, we welcome um, audience questions, which we will be discussing after all the speakers have presented. Um, and uh, please enter your questions into the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Um, if you would like to follow up or continue to the discussion with the speakers or with a particular speaker, please do share your email address in the Q&A function as well. Um, and, uh, at the end of this, um, to make sure that you don't miss any of these um, upcoming events, um, you can sign up for our events mailing link uh, using the link in the chat box. So um, let's see, I wanna, I see our, our first speaker, but are the others, I guess the other speakers are, yes, there's one. Aditya, do you know if um, Bhavani is also going to be joining? Aditya? Um, yeah, so Bhavani, so Bhavani has sent me a video, so I'm going to share my screen and then after that. So it's a joint presentation, but I fabulous. think it's around 3 a.m. in the morning for her, so she's not able to join. Of course, of course. Okay, fabulous. Thank you, Aditya. So we've got Tim, Sujit, Aditya, and Bhavani. I'm going to do the introductions now. So now I'd like to introduce our first speaker on the panel. Um, Arti Sridhara uh, is a PhD candidate at the University of Amsterdam and uh, the program head of uh, Dakshin Foundation. Um, the title of Arti's talk today is, and it's kind of nicely building on one of the threads in Sujit's talk. Um, the title is uh, Fishery Science and Law <clears throat> in the Raj, um, for Forging Cultures of Fact. So over to you, Arti. Hi, thank you. I'm going to just start by sharing my screen. Um, As you do that, um, I'm just going to remind the audience too, if you have questions, please feel free to pop them in the, um, the, the Q&A box and we will field them at the end of the, uh, uh, at the, end of the presentations. Okay, I, uh, you're ready to begin then, Arti. Um, yeah, sorry, I have one technical question. If I'm sharing the screen, can I also see my notes on the side? Um, I don't know the answer to that question. Yes, I uh, on, on PowerPoint, you should be able to in your presentation mode. Uh, I think it should be possible. Uh, we, won't, we will not be seeing your notes. That's right. Um, RT, we see your slide, but we do not see your notes. Okay, thank you for inviting me. You don't see them now? We see the slide, but we don't see the uh, the notes, yeah. Do you? Okay, all right. So, uh, thanks again then for inviting me. Um, as uh, Anthony said, I am uh, doing a PhD work from one of my chapters, uh, from my PhD thesis which is a historical society of fishery science in India. Um, it's kind of anchored by ideas in the sociology of science, but also from other streams like environmental history and the history of science. Um, so this chapter that I'm going to talk about, it unpacks the making of the Indian Fisheries Act of 1897 by examining various fact-making practices in the 19th century around what was considered like the problem of injury to fish supply. So this Indian Fisheries Act was the first legislation that was passed for the regulation of fishing practices across the breadth of British India. It legitimized state intervention in fisheries across millions of acres of Indian inland uh, uh, waters, but also the marine seascape, at least up to one uh, marine league or three nautical miles. So of course, when we speak about water and colonial hydraulic interventions, uh, David Gil Martin's work has been seminal. And I want to draw attention to this one term that he has introduced, uh, colonial resource regime. And he presents it as a sort of coming together of science and empire in a particular manner, which aided colonial control. Uh, it's this manner that I want to focus on in this story. Um, 
but for that i will i will draw from uh, barbara shapiro uh, uh, who's a historian of science uh, and some of her concepts uh, she's added a very valuable dimension to environmental histories by arguing that practices in natural history of uh, what constituted a fact and who was qualified to determine this that they they are actually chased Traces back to practices in the realm of law, uh, at least the 15th century, and then have created in their way generations of what he calls cultures of fact. Uh, so, in particular, what you see is that both in the realm of science as well as in the realm of law, you have uh, uh, different hierarchies of who is uh, allowed to decide on matters of law or on matters of fact. who might be a particular credible witness whose testimony is more credible if if one wants to understand this sociologically i think we would need to understand how these histories of resource regimes uh, they become also histories of traveling facts so from uh, i think these uh, very small accounts of uh, fishes from francis buchanan's uh, account of fishes of the ganges of 1822 for example uh, and other sporadic naturalists accounts you can kind of assume that the the first formal so called scientific fishery studies began only in the around the 18th century under the eic rule but later um, they picked up steam with more becoming more sort of formal resource assessments under british rule in the latter half of the 19th century so we see that this is also because of the kind of lucrative molluscan fisheries that were taking place in some parts uh, but also you know not so well known uh, uh, fish products such as fish maw so this this these regions where these kind of initial experiments of resource assessment were taking place was a region marked by long histories of trade and cultural values and this quantification of this harvest it really began as a an effort to manage the resources efficiently but also without corruption and in, in some sense to make an ideal harvest and of course we know a lot about this from uh, archival records and these archival records have a certain ebb and flow for example in icing glass you can see that much of the records at least in certain archives tend to disappear so yes we must look beyond these archives but nonetheless there is still enough uh, of a story that you at uh, the foot of these grand colonial anecdotes the earliest references in these colonial records on the topic of injury or the preservation of fish uh, they trace to records of the madras presidency in the 1860s the concern about the injury to fish it's it's traced to a, uh, uh, just a simple note made by general sir arthur cotton who was then in charge of irrigation and public works uh, there he is uh arthur cotton had begun his career with madras engineers in the 1830s and he gained fame for his irrigation improvement works across major uh, south indian rivers Uh, and also for proselytizing large scale irrigation as means of poverty alleviation and revenue generation. For this, he was both revered as well as criticized more than three after his death. So, in 80, 1867, he wrote to his friend Colonel Haley that he had noticed in the Kolaru Nanikar uh, that a product. as soon as the rains came down and immense quantities were taken at it of course generally full of fro and now there's not a whole lot more that he says in his letter but this letter makes its journey across uh, multiple offices and and leads to a, a full fledged investigation of this allegation of injury but i think that there's something else that we can observe about this particular letter you know and try to read between what the word says and what the actions that possibly took place were so how do we read cotton's letter i mean do we do we sort of was he admitting that these anecdotes were problematic uh, that they stopped this what were the ways in which harm or the injury to fish was actually being investigated 
but but in Martin's letter itself, we find several clues as to how the right and the wrong around this fact of injury was determined. You know, the, by 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 talking about uh, undefined people or the catch at the Anikert and so on. Uh, at this time, there were also there, were, there was also some sort of attempt to to uh, kind of introducing what are called halfway technologies, such as these fish ladders. Um, much uh, discussion about it, but you know, eventually, as one of the uh, officials from Delhi had uh, put it, possibly talking about the Yamuna barrage, he said that sometimes, yes, there's a very wholesale destruction of fish in the canal when the waters are suddenly shut off. But I fancy uh, cannot well be, but this I fancy cannot well be avoided. So it was almost like a fate to complete uh, at, at that point. Now, this short note from uh, led to uh, the Inspector General of Irrigation at that time, Colonel Richard Strachey, uh, actually kicking off these nationwide investigations with multiple testimony, testimonials which he wanted to gather from collectors. As we know, the collector was a very important administrative official at that time, and the manner in which It looks like we might have lost Arthi. Um, oh, there you are, Arthi. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, it's a bad connection here. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Um, w is it possible to, to show your slideshow and then have your video off? Probably not, huh? No, it should be possible, I think. Let me try. Sometimes video off means that you could, um, it, it, it helps stabilize the connection. Is this possible? Is this working? It looks yeah, like that, works. that works. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so you're back. You're back, Arthi. All right, and you can hear me all right. Huh? Much better, yeah. So maybe, yeah, video off and then you can just share. Sorry, unstable connection here. Huh? That's okay. So, okay, so where was I? I yeah, so, so this, in, in these years, these, Collectors, they started off this huge nationwide investigation, but mostly they relied on very specific people to inform them. Uh, and, and they looked at beyond uh, injury at the anecdotes, they also uh, started looking at weirs and other sort of obstructions on uh, river systems. Uh, what they saw and what they heard about, they described as wanton uh, or destructive fishing. Uh, with the use of uh, natural poisons from a range of plants, uh, fine mesh nets and collective uh, fishing. So all of these practices were either unfamiliar in Britain, in the British context, or, or were already decried in that context uh, uh, as, as harmful to private property. So the attention eventually focused away from the weirs and the anecdotes themselves to the forms of fishing. And the unruly, disordered natives in large numbers, they contributed centrally to this idea of wanton fishing. One must also remember that this was a time which, um, you know, Warren, uh, Warwick Anderson has described as the century of acclimatization. Uh, this was a time when facts, when objects uh, and ideas, uh, they traveled across oceans carrying the promising message of acclimatization. And most of the piscicultural efforts were to control and intervene in fish life cycles, to control its agency, primarily the, the main one of living and dying. And it was all part of this particular infrastructure. The early uh, 19th century French piscicultural logic, and, and this is uh, either aquaculture or sea culture, it was, it was concerned with progress and about improving the quality of the rivers, enhancing aquatic wild and preferred species. And uh, this had transformed French rivers profoundly, but also their property relations. The British specialists and the gentlemen naturalists who were concerned with angling and natural history, they were impressed and influenced by this French example. And they sought to kind of apply its methods to British territories, both at home and in distant uh, 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 
uh, colonies. So these uh, manuals were created, books were written, artifacts, all of the... Looks, are you uh, there? Are you there, Arthi? I think we've lost her. Did we? Maybe we can wait like one minute. Yeah, yeah. She she had to, I mean, there's about five minutes left uh, in her time, so, or thereabouts. Um, uh, we can hope that she, oh, I think we lost her. Yeah, I think the connection's pretty bad. Yeah. So well, it's understandable. She, she got through most of it, and that's 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 good. Yeah. That's a that's good to work with. I'm sure she'll rejoin us, and maybe when she does, we can bring her, perhaps give her a little uh, a minute or two during the Q and A to kind of wrap up if she to kind of do a conclusion. Let us now go to our third speaker. Um, sorry, let me get my uh, my guide here. So yes, now on to our third speaker. Um, um, and I'd like to welcome our third speaker to the panel. So Timothy B. Uh, P. Barnard is an associate professor um, in the Department of History at the National University of Singapore. And the talk, uh, the title of Tim's talk today is, quote, they all drank um, water and the foundation of early colonial Singapore. Um, over to you, Tim. Hey, thank you, Anthony. I appreciate it. Uh, let me take over control here and share the screen and then we can get going and see how this goes. Okay, I, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us, particularly this, you know, kind of getting towards late in the afternoon here in Singapore. Um, when Anthony first contacted me about this uh, Wet Natures conference, uh, it reminded me of a class that I'm sure he taught, he took also as a graduate student, because I took one as a graduate student from Leonard Andaya on water in Southeast Asia. And the main focus of his uh, discussions and talks were usually about the importance of the, you know, uh, straits and seas and understanding of knowledge of the waters, movement over it and and things like that. And we've seen that reflected in the papers given today, where we've talked about everything from canals to uh, mangrove swamps to uh, fish, fish and various aspects of it. And I wanna talk about a different form of wet nature in the sense of what do we drink every day? In other words, you know, a glass of water. And the, the fundamental question, this is a research project I'm doing now in the writing of a monograph is, in a sense, where did we get a glass of water in the history of Singapore at different times? And how did this reflect changes to the society, developments, uh, and, and such over a period? And to begin this, I would like to emphasize not what's written on the screen uh, that you see right now, but the actual drawing. This is one, uh, if not the earliest colonial map of Singapore, even though it says 1864 in the lower right hand screen, that's when that's the registration number at the archives and queue and such at the home office and what have you. This uh, uh, map, and I like this map because it's a different angle, a different perspective of Singapore, was made in February 1819 of the uh, you know, of, of what's going on in Singapore. And I'll, I'll get into that in a, uh, a second of why it's of some importance. But we're here today to talk about water in the sense that while water is very important for transportation, for its uh, ability to sustain uh, ecosystem, you know, or its importance to ecosystems, of course, but also to sustain protein within it with fish and what have you. Uh, importantly, as humans, we need water to drink is a, a necess necessity for our own sustenance and societies, communities and civilizations have been based around the development or access to water for both agriculture, but more importantly, for our own consumption. And this leads to the title 
for this particular talk, they all drank. It is based on uh, two different accounts of the arrival of British colonialism in Singapore. And in one account, which appeared in a collection of, we'll say colonial tales, and the other one from Munshi Abdullah and the Hikayat Abdullah, in uh, these accounts, it is said that within the first day of arrival of uh, the British in Singapore, uh, Raffles ordered in one account that a well or be uh, dug underneath a kalat tree. In the account from Munchi Abdullah Farquhar ordered the uh, digging of a well under the Eugenia tree. And in both instances, when they hit water, they all drank. In other words, water was the key to the development of Singapore as a colonial port, access to water. One of the things when we look at the Straits of Malacca, you have the mangrove swamps that line it. It's a lot of it is about easy access to water so that they can uh, put it on ships and sustain the, the trade that's going through here and also support a community that is uh, established here. One of the reasons Singapore was chosen over alternatives such as uh, Batam or uh, other neighboring islands was the easy access to uh, drinkable water. And by the way, a kala tree, I am not going to pronounce it. It's a, you can see a picture of one on the right, a Eugenia tree. Uh, you can see the scientific, the Latin name of it underneath. It's really kind of a shrub, but okay, fair enough. Uh, but let's move on to the actual map in the background and the idea of how this is important for the development of Singapore. Well, when Raffles arrived in Singapore in January, February 1819, he was accompanied by seven ships. And one of those ships was the Investigator, which is a wonderful name for a ship. And the captain of that ship was Daniel Ross. And Daniel Ross, while Farquhar and Raffles were doing their political things on shore, uh, Ross is the one that went around the island determining like where there were, you know, drawing maps and doing things of this, uh, you know, as such, and writing reports. And one of the things that Ross wrote, as you can see on 17th, uh, 7th of February, 1819, is that fresh water is to be had at several places in the vicinity of the town. And there are some small rivers along the coast to the eastward where the water appears red. And I've circled the uh, points within his map here, where you have the village of Singapore, uh, which would have been the small community along the river that was mainly growing pepper and gambier, uh, up to about a thousand people. And then there was a watering place off to the right, uh, more likely where the um, Rochor stream or, and then the uh, Kalan River enter the uh, uh, ocean there. But let's get on to what actually happened once the British established themselves in Singapore. In June uh, 1719, uh, for those of you unfamiliar with Singaporean history, Raffles comes, gets credit, signs all this stuff, and he leaves Farquhar behind to basically establish the port and then sends orders and medals and things for several years, uh, Raffles does. Raffles ordered Farquhar in uh, June uh, 1819 to prioritize the construction of convenient watering places for shipping. And what was done was, Water, uh, he, he developed an aqueduct and a, a, a tank for collecting water on the edge of Fort Can what today is called Fort Canning Hill. And you can see it in this early, uh, this is one of the early maps of Colonial Singapore, uh, famously known as the Jackson Plan. And so the top one is kind of what the whole map is, or the, the plan is, and you can see on the bottom, you can, uh, if you're familiar with Singapore, you can identify many of these places. The uh, open square would be the Padang, where you see Flagstaff is uh, on Fort Canning Hill. So on that, that steep slope down toward the river, and then what we now have is Chinatown on the left side of the river, there was a watering place developed where it was collected in tanks. Water was taken from the other side of the hill, where there were wells and springs and even the Stamford Stream. And it was brought to uh, the, the other side and put in a tank and ships would go up the river. And at this tank, they would then load casks or barrels of water 
onto uh, barges that would then go out to the larger trading ships in the harbor. And this was one of the main functions of the port of Singapore. It was the ability of it to provide services to those who had arrived uh, trading between India and China, for example. Now, the maintenance of this tank and of this water supply was very important in early Singapore. In 1823, Crawford, uh, who took over from Farquhar, developed a new water course uh, to this reservoir. He expanded that reservoir so that there was uh, the tanks were much larger and it was basically 11 and a third meters. So basically uh, 30 feet uh, of frontage on the river. And there were three spouts so you could load casks uh, at three different places onto your ship. Uh, and then take it out to the larger vessels in the harbor. Now, the, there was uh, complaints about uh, the maintenance of this aqueduct. There were you know, problems with it deteriorating, making sure it all uh, uh, was maintained well in these first uh, couple of decades. But essentially, that's how water was taken out to ships. And so what we have in early colonial Singapore is a, let me move to the next, uh, a system that develops for at least ships in the harbor, and then I'll talk about residents of Singapore in a second, which was known as fetch and pay. Fetch and pay was a system with, in which they use lighters. Now, of course, this photograph is from 70, 80 years later, but they use lighters, small barges, uh, you know, uh, flat bottom barges, which would transport casks from the government aqueduct, which means the one on the edge of Fort Canning Hill, to ships in the harbor. This was under the control of five uh, specific individuals, five companies, basically. Uh, one of the more famous ones was a guy uh, run by a guy named William Temperton, in which uh, they provided services to the ships in the harbor. They would uh, pay uh, three uh, uh, rupees per ton of water transported out to the ships. And it was one of the main things that, uh, besides actually participating in trade, it was one of the main reasons ships, of course, would uh, stop in the harbor to replenish their water supply and such before they moved on to wherever they were going. Um, now, if you were a resident of Singapore, you you could get water from those, the, the, the reservoir on the other side of Fort Canning Hill, but it wasn't common. Most people had wells in their yards or in their compounds. And the best ones were located at the base of hills. You had to go down about 10 to 12 feet, which is three or three and a half meters deep in order to access water. But there was a problem. Most, most of that water was quite brackish, okay, uh, quite salty. And during periods of drought, they, uh, they would run dry. Now, this links in also to uh, earlier research uh, that Fiona Williamson conducts on weather and meteorology and the importance of the climate in Singapore and making sure there's a plentiful rainfall. And when they go through periods of drought, this uh, creates problems with the wells and the, the amount of water that's available to the community. Now, this becomes of importance in Singapore as the port develops. Okay, uh, the port is to provide these services to passing ships. They need water to support the community that is growing in colonial Singapore. And this becomes important as the colony develops. And I will give you two instances, both for the trade in the harbor, but also the people that lived here. Uh, so, and it, it reflects the changes and pressures the society was undergoing. So let's talk about empire, trade, population growth. Uh, they provide these services in the harbor, and it was part of the basic uh, uh, ability of the government to, to support the ships and the trade of the English East India Company. Now, the thing is, this was often put under a tremendous amount of pressure, particularly if there were large number of uh, ships in the harbor. And as trade grew, this became more problematic. And at one point where it actually reached a, a crisis point was in late 1840, when the British fleet that was going to China for the Opium War uh, stopped in Singapore. 
So the nemesis, this early steamship and early warship came to Singapore. The uh, ability of the various companies to uh, provide water to these ships under the fetch and pay system was stressed beyond to a point of breaking. There was a 24 hour wait time for water uh, at the tanks uh, at Fort Canning Hill. Uh, supposedly wells ran dry and it created such a problem that there was a number of letters passed between Calcutta and Singapore, you know, like get your act together type of thing uh, was the tone of the letters. And there was a need to improve the, the system of water delivery into the uh, town of Singapore. And, and so the opium fleet or whatever you want to call that, the British fleet uh, was in a sense, a turning point in the need to deliver water to the town in a more uh, uh, economic way. But as the town grew, the quality and the availability of water continued to decline in the 1840s and 1850s. And one of the symbols of this is the famous Kampung Glam fire, which took place in 1847. Basically in 1847, the district, the area of Kampung Glam burned to the ground. There are shires, there are poems about it, as you can see here on the left. This is an example of one of them. Uh, and this, th this fire was a, a, a turning point for people who lived in the town because one of the reasons the fire was able to uh, uh, spread so quickly was that the wells were dry and the ability of, to fight the fire was limited. And so we need to have better wells, we need to have better access to water for not only drinking, but for public services. And so what happened after 1847 was that the Al Junaid family, a prominent Arab family in Singapore, began to sponsor the construction of public wells. And under the Al Junaid family sponsorship, there were four main public wells developed. One was in Kampung Malacca, one was in Salegi Road, one was uh, in Pungul Kisang, and one was in Telo Ayer. You may not recognize all of these places today because uh, names change in Singapore. For example, Kampung Malacca was near what is Chinatown today. Uh, you're probably familiar with Selegi Road and Telo Ayer if you live in Singapore. Uh, but this was all of this was also occurring because the population was growing. You know, we, we talk about, oh, a prosperous port and, uh, the, you know, it became very important to British imperial rule. Well, as the port grew, the stresses and the needs of water for the community grew, of course. So, for example, when the population in 1836 was 30,000, it had tripled within 35 years. By 1871, it was 97,000. And it is during this period, during this growth, you know, we can just guesstimate, once the population hit 50,000, we're under a tremendous amount of pressure uh, to deliver water for not only trade and not only the economy, but also just simply for the people to you know, live in this town, to make life livable in the colonial town of Singapore. And so this leads to these pressures and to address these issues, the, the government needs to be able to deliver water. And so one of the things they did, and it, it took place over the beginning in plans in the 1850s and throughout the 1860s, and was delayed by a number of reasons, but to just wrap up this early colonial time within my time frame here, uh, to address these issues, reservoirs and new delivery systems needed to be constructed, public wells, piping systems, and ultimately, the uh, reservoir, the impounding reservoir, which today we call McRitchie Reservoir, was constructed. Now, it then became a problem of how to get that water to the town and how to pipe it and where it goes in the town, but that's another story. But what I want to emphasize and, and end at that, it's kind of the end of the um, you know, section on this early colonial part, is it raises these issues of how water is an essential compound, ha ha, but it's intrinsic and, and, and very important and interconnected with the historical development of the colonial society. It's not simply about movement over water through trade and, and, and while mangrove swamps are important and the fish that come from them, but the actual delivery and ability to find drinking water 
is a, a, a key way in which we can better understand the development of a society and a community. And in this example here in Singapore. And so with that, I will leave you be, I'll leave it again on this wonderful map and description. Uh, I love this map, my favorite one of Singapore. And I'll turn it back over to Anthony and then uh, I welcome your questions and I look forward to them. So thank you. And let me so, get rid yeah. of my sharing. Yeah. Fabulous stuff, Tim. Thank you again for, for sharing and um, for uh, walking us through that early sort of story of, of water and the founding of Singapore, really. And um, yeah, lovely stuff. And I look forward to the Q&A to, kind of, um, to, to, to kind of explore that discussion. Um, let me turn to my notes. So now we've got, um, actually, yeah, shedding, just shedding light really on, on old Singapore in a new way. That's, that's really kind of lovely. Um, let me now turn to, uh, we've got our last presenters on this panel. Um, I'd like to welcome our, our speakers for this panel. And we've got um, Bhavani Raman, who I think will be uh, uh, visiting us via video, and um, Aditya Ramesh. Uh, Bhavani is an associate professor in the Department of History at the University of Toronto. Um, and Aditya is a, a presidential fellow in the Department of History at the University of Manchester. Um, together, uh, the title of their talk today um, is The Many Meanings of the Koum, um, uh, Inventing Urban Hydrographies. Is that right? Hydrographies? Yeah. Hydrographies in Chennai. And over to you, Aditya. And thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anthony. Thank you so much, Chitra. Um, thanks for this invitation. So. The presentation will be slightly unorthodox, so I'm going to share my screen, wherein then Bhavani will um, present the first part of the paper, and then we'll turn back, and then I'll carry on from there and present the second part of the paper. And hopefully, if we're doing badly on time, just let me know. Um, so you'll have 20 minutes, and I'll I think I'll just pop back in video-wise uh, right around that time. So. Fantastic. We, we love unorthodox. So, <laughs> um, all right, here we go. So, I'm going to, I can you see my screen, Anthony? Yes, I can. Yes. Hello, and uh, thank you for inviting me and Aditya Ramesh to uh, present our work on the poem at this wonderful conference organized by NUSEO College. I must especially thank Professor. Chitra Venkatarambi for her warm invitation. Um, I'm very sorry I cannot be with you um, either in person or even actually virtually. And I'm grateful uh, to Dr. Ramesh for uh, you know, agreeing to uh, you know, transcend the time zone. Oops. Aditya, could you maybe increase the volume? Slightly? Yeah, that's what, that's exactly what I was looking to do. But I, in the process, I have somehow managed to. Okay. Hello, and uh, thank you for inviting me and Aditya Ramesh to uh, present our work on the Kuam. Okay, can you, Anthony, can you see my screen still? Yes, yes, I can. Okay, and just 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 tell me when if you see the video because I yeah. Hello and comments, uh, which I'm sure will be yeah. Very I can see it and it sounds good. Forward, let me uh, share my screen and um, take you through the first part of what we hope to be uh, the paper um, that we are. Um, uh, interested in writing. Um, so our paper is about the Kuam, and um, in that uh, context, um, I suppose we want to be able to show that the Kuam was central to the making of the city of Chennai, formerly Madras, particularly its bridges, drainage systems, and neighborhoods. Um, the Kuam's ecological history and its management uh, is inextricable, inextricable, that is to say, cannot be abstracted from the wider socio-ecological inequity that the city has fostered. Its uh, seasonal rhythms and interactions with the wider hydrology of Chennai actively built 
unequal access to clean air and water into the infrastructure of the city, city and river, waste and hygiene, sewage and water remade each other as a water body and the city cultivated particular epistemic solutions to the problems posed by wet nature. So to us, the problem of the poem encompasses health, its relationship to the sea, the rains, people, animals who lived in and around it, and finally, of course, to the image of the city itself. Um, yet the same geography, and this is one thing that we'd like to underscore, is the same geography of waste, the same geography of in insalubrity has also offered sanctuary for generations of urban settlers, even as it has posed itself as a kind of problem which has attracted uh, colonial um, intervention, colonial and post-colonial uh, intervention. So our first section really deals with the invention of the river, taking a cue from Dilip Takuna's um, you know, recent work on how the idea of a geography of a river is invented. And in that context, we found that actually in the early 19th century, there was a significant hydrological restructuring of the, uh, uh, the water body poem uh, so as to make it, uh, you know, flow like a river. Um, and so um, when we started looking into uh, the hydrological history of the river, um, what becomes very apparent is that the poem has no, you know, real point of origin. Uh, it emerges from a stream or a drainage network uh, associated with the Pala drainage system. And at a certain point in Takkulam, it kind of branches off from what then becomes the Kosakalia River that moves uh, to the north to meander to the through the city. So prior to the kind of hydrological intervention by the East India Company, you have to imagine the poem as part of a Irikulam landscape where sheets of water overflowed uh, during the monsoon and there was a great deal of water management using traditional sluices, gates, embankments, and uh, mud work, earthwork, um, and so on. Um, in the early 19th century, starting from about the 1800, I would say, we see a series of colonial um, ruminations on the poem, a series of proposals and plans, um, and also a series of images painted, uh, which are kind of an ode to the monumentality of uh, British hydroengineering. And you can see one such example um, in, this, um, in this image. Um, so, you know, the thing that kind of really strikes you in the archive that accompanies this kind of painting work is that um, the Kuam is a, a, a shallow river that is in fact resistant to any kind of uh, flushing of flow. Um, through much of the 18th century, the Kuam would flood the embankments that protected the settlements of Madras near its mouth. And it made the area between the Kuam and the Elambo, which is a, a, a sort of a riverine channel that uh, moved um, sort of northwards, you can see it here, uh, subject to a great deal of flooding. Um, we can see in 1798, this is a map from 1798, um, certain kinds of embankments and a small and a bridge was made over um, the island. Um, uh, and in a way, the earthworks were basically to protect both the fort in the south and to a degree, the Chandadri Pete settlement in the north. You can also see from this map that, in fact, the relationship between land and water is fairly blurred. Now, when we um, uh, look at this kind of cartographic imagery, and we started looking at, and I started looking at um, some of the kind of archival petitioning and various proposals, um, what what we sort of came up with, really, what other than what I really came up with. And, you know, Aditya kind of con concurred, is that um, you get to see the poem as a series of, you know, shallow marshlands, right, which are, in a way, um, uh, which along with this map clarify that the poem was a river, only in the sense of uh, a flowing river, only in, 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 in me. Um, in fact, uh, one of the engineers, Haviland, writes that the river was in fact one in name. It was filled with effluvia and miasma because it had no defined bed as it flowed around the village. An extensive sheet of water shrank when dry and the filth deposited in it therefore accumulated. The bed was widely dug for soil and sand. And when these holes were filled with water, walking across the bed became hazardous. So you really have to come to grips with the seasonality of this river to understand how, um, how much um, colonial hydroengineering kind of reinvented um, what it stood for, and you know exactly and how it how it flowed. 
So I'll sort of skip over some of the details that we detail in our longer paper. Uh, there were interventions primarily um, when there were petitions from European inhabitants complaining of you know, nuisance or smell. Um, there were a couple of interventions when the Chindadri Pete inhabitants complained of flooding. But I suppose the most severe um, uh, moment came uh, in, 19, in 1817, I'm sorry, when the Havilland really uh, deep started to begin to deepen the riverbed, try to deepen the riverbed and create a kind of structure of embankments, um, you know, using uh, a lot of what we might call as, you know, dredging uh, techniques uh, with the help of a vast number of laborers. Now, this intervention, in a way, allows us to um, understand how um, the Kuwams um, uh, sort of, you know, some of the kind of contemporary understandings of the Kuwam, which also depend on a sort of a, uh, you know, which also sort of produce this idea of a kind of a river I understand. In fact, created by this kind of technique of annual um, dredging. Now, if the Kuwam was not an ancient free flowing river, um, as you know, water nostalgists might have it, then on what account, on what terms can we account for its history? So um, this began to pose to me a kind of uh, an interesting problem. And when, you know, discussing this matter with uh, Aditya, I really turned to uh, a map in um, that dates also from this period, which is from 1803, which gives us a sense of the preoccupation of colonial governors with opening up or keeping the channels of the river open to the sea. So this idea of open communication attracted a series of proposals in the first decade of the 19th century. And the whole kind of um, manifestation of this is really in the form of these sluices that you can see in um, right here on the map, right? And you can see that these are kind of running alongside um, the fort and these were intended to protect the fort from flooding. Now, um, the reason why this um, uh, proposal was set up was also actually because of the desire of the East India Company to set up and stabilize the coastline uh, in order to build a safe um, water harbor. Um, through much of the 19th century, um, the Madras Harbor existed only in name in the sense that it was a roadstead. Um, a sandy beach had to be forded in order for every bale of cotton and every cask of wine and every person who arrived from Europe on the, on the, on the ships. And the primary infrastructure, again, that was used was the labor of uh, the partner of the community, uh, fishermen, mariners, boatmen. And they were the ones who provided the kind of logistical infrastructure of help uh, to move these goods across um, the surf uh, using the very famous, um, you know, Masula boat. So um, at some point, um, so we see what, in the early 19th century story as giving us both a kind of dependence on these Masula boats and the boatmen who plied them, as well as this desire to stabilize the coastline. Um, till about 1837, the plans were really not followed through with any great success. Um, but around 1837, we get to see um, a kind of a, a desire to stabilize the coastline by actually stabilizing the, um, the mouth of the Kuan. And here is when um, I think we get the really um, a sort of uh, investment, the real investment in creating the Kuan as a tidal river. So, you know, the events of the 1830s and 40s um, in the archives show us that there was a fair amount of interest in shaping, reshaping the river. You know, so Haviland had built his uh, bridges in the 1820s and about 10 years later, um, there's a kind of an investment in um, creating the Kuam as a tidal river that would, you know, be open to the sea, where the sea would enter um, and flush um, uh, the the island, the area of the island around, and it would also allow for the stabilization of the coastline because it would allow for sand to accrete um, in the um, uh, in the uh, leeward side, um, allowing for this kind of hydroengineering to take place. Now the point, and this is where you know I end my portion of the, the presentation, and I'll have Aditya look. Uh, take you through the third part, which is, um, and I'll just set it up here, which is to say that the intertidal aspect of the hydroengineering, right? Um, not just, you know, this communication with the river and the sea, in fact, I think also allows us to see how um, saltwater, freshwater, and sewage management 
has been central uh, to the hydro engineering of the poem from the get-go. And in a way, it goes quite long, I think, for me in explaining why, in fact, today in Chennai, one of the kind of structural hydrological problems has been the municipality's like inability to separate sewage infrastructure from drainage, storm drainage infrastructure. That is to say, the mitigation of floods and the management of sewage were kind of, the Quam kind of brings the two together because it served both as a stormwater drain and as um, a sewer. Um, and therefore, you know, um, uh, and, and to this, we might also add, um, there was a really uh, quite a deep hydrological investment in yoking the energy of the sea uh, to manage, you know, to kind of create a kind of engineering, uh, hydro engineering model um, that would allow a kind of a low cost solution to the sanitation and odor problem. Um, so let me stop here and I will have. I'm now going to take over. Thank you very much for. Great. The... And, and maybe about, I think, eight, eight to 10 minutes, maybe, Aditya? That's perfect. That's all I need. Okay. Um, okay. Just give me one second. I'm just trying to start the slideshow. <laughs> Um, you can see my screen? Yes, yes, can we can okay. see it. All right. Um, fantastic. Just give me a second. Sorry. Okay, so um, I'm just going to start from where Bhavani um, left. I'll just read a little bit. It's not too much longer. So from the 1850s to around 1920 or so, the idea of the Kuom as a tidal river was largely forgotten and the Kuom was largely engulfed in discussions around drainage. How to ensure that it does not become a sewer was the focus of most of the discussion. But from the early decades of the 20th century, the Madras Corporation, the Public Works Department, local politicians and residents of neighborhoods adjoining the Kuom all started to identify or re-identify the Kuom as a very specific riverine problem of flow of capital and of aesthetic. Rather than viewed as one part of the drainage system, the public works department gained further power and the river emerged as a distinct urban problem, which required specific solutions. So it em emerged as a problem of a river rather than as a problem of drainage as it had done in the last 50 years or so. From the 1920s, a series of schemes began on the Kuom and each scheme proposed to engineer the water geography differently. The objective was singular, the recrafting of the Kuom into a tidal river, ensuring that its waters flow and in turn resolve the problem of effluent sewage and smell. In 1920, Sir Tyagaraya Chetty, um, whom the suburb of Tinagar or Tyagaraya Nagar, which is a thriving market today, um, one of the central markets of Chennai, would be named, constituted a committee to look into the improvement of the Kuom. In a break from previous drainage committees, um, Chetty, as a politician and, and a resident of the city and an important and powerful resident of the city, suggested that the river was actually a distinct problem or an urban problem, which was more specific than drainage at large. So it could not be viewed only as part of a drainage solution, and but it had to be viewed as a river problem. The committee that Chetty instituted recommended that the Kuom be converted into a tidal river. So it goes back into the imagination of the 1940s and 50s, which had been lost for the last 50, 60 years. That is, it would drain year round to the Bay of Bengal and engineering could at once resolve issues of drainage, stench and ensure a flowing river for the city. Chetty's committee proposed to do this by means of a canal that would flow from Napier Bridge and Bhavani spoke about bridge building. Napier Bridge was a very, very important bridge. Um, uh, which was built across the Kuom by its mouth into a larger drainage outlet, either in the form of a sea or another tank, or even close to the Madras Harbour. And you can see here a map of the new drainage scheme that was being planned 
around the Kuam, um, the various points where the choke points where drainage was coming in and how to stop that and how to try and create it into a tidal river. This was the central problem that was facing many in the 1920s. <clears throat> this was part of a much broader global impulse on urban rivers. As the investigating engineer for Chetty's committee, um, this guy named Bristow laid out, municipal governments across the world were investing in training urban rivers. To transform the Kuom into a tidal river was hardly a simple process. Bristow argued that as far as rivers go, the Kuom was a rather poor excuse for one and had always been. The river, according to Bristow, had never been systematically improved and therefore how could it be a river? In this way, the tide could have never been encouraged higher up, this, higher up the river. This resulted therefore in the lack of littoral drift or the movement of sand and in its stead a sandbar that did not allow water to pass beyond it was created or indeed had always existed. The second problem according to Bristow was that the Kuam being a river was severely affected by the formation of the island ground. And you can see that it doesn't easily move into uh, the ocean. Instead, it's there's it, it splits into two, right? And that's the island ground. So there's a northern and southern arm, and this destroys any momentum which would carry water into the sea. But also, Brista was unsure about how other openings, which included the Buckingham Canal built in the late 19th century, the Oteri Nala, which was the Nala, Nala as a drain, which was a central drain, and Kelly's drain, affected the possibility of a tidal river. All of these at some point or the other intersected with the comb. So how do we get a tidal river if it becomes a part of a broader drainage system? The only way of quote unquote training the Kuam and remaking its natural state of being, right, was to break through the bar through dredging and laborious maintenance work. The canal from the harbor to the Kuam, which would bring in tidal water into the river, was specific was designed specifically to avoid the bar and directly allow tidal waters into the Kuam. So again, it became connected to the harbor of the city, um, wherein rather than go through the sandbar, the project tried to bring water from the harbor straight into the Kuam and try to infuse seawater into fresh water in that way. But this was, I just want to give you a flavor. This was just one amongst many experiments that attempted to rethink the Kuam as a river in the 20th century. And Arthi mentioned, you know, resource regimes um, and David Kilmartin's project. And this seems anything other than a resource regime. Rather than large scale engineering projects, which promised revenue, the Kuam as a water geography was a series of smaller experiments. It was filled with patchwork systems, retrofitted engineering to remake the river into a tidal one, and in that way, attempt to remake the city. Okay. Finally, I'm just going to touch on this, uh, and I'm going to touch on the settlement of Chintadri Petai, right? And Bhavani spoke about petitions, the language of nuisance that was used by European residents living along the river. But in the 20th century, this the double bind of Chintadri Pete, as Bhavani mentioned as well, was that it was both a refuge for several um, uh, uh, members of uh, the rich communities, and it was home to Napier Park, which was one of the largest parks in the city, but it was also um, where common lands of the city existed and the urban poor had settled, right? And it was precisely this language of nuisance that the makers of the Quam schemes in the 1920s and 30s turned to. The banks of the river and training were now clearly occupied. As a recent Tamil novel titled Petai, which is on Chintadri Petai, suggests, this was actually a weaving settlement. And as land around Chintadri Petai and the Kuam River became more and more valuable, the weavers and other communities who joined the weavers, typically servants who worked for the British factory workers, were all pushed to the banks of the river, uh, to the river Kuam where there was Porambok land. And Porambok is a Tamil term for common lands, right? So this was government lands where you could encroach and you could not be easily thrown out. So many of these people were pushed into the, into the banks of the land, whereas they actually had a settlement that the British had given them legally to occupy um, in 1804. In a question to the Madras Legislative Assembly as part of the engineering schemes to clean the Quam uh, and whether they were working, uh, a local politician C.S. Govindaraja Mudaliar asked whether the Madras Corporation was keeping, quote unquote, a special watch over the insanitary situation on the banks of the Kuam, especially in the vicinity where the Cherry slums are located. In reply, the Madras Corporation reassured the legislator that the adjoining Cherries in particular 
alongside the river bank was now a matter for the police commissioner who had taken this up communities which had been settled and resettled in chintadri pete were now criminalized more generally so they were regarded as a some in the madras police um files as as a community be, to be kept special watch over so this history is but a beginning of a story for the unequal battle for lands around the kuam which still persists and eventually in the 1950s or so um this becomes the cox cherry which becomes the first site of intervention um for for uh, the chennai improvement trust it lies on the fringes of the, with the kuam on the one side and the pakka buildings of chintadri pete on the other side sandwiched between the two and this em- emerged as one of the crucial sites within the city for uh, discussions around public health the housing question and land uh, contestation in madras and chennai city just um one last image uh, this is of chief minister um, karuna nidhi who was chief minister for for a long long time uh, and he's on a boat ride in the kuam and i'll tell you why this is relevant i'm not randomly showing you this image so just very quickly recapitulating the main arguments so the refrain today you know the kuam today if you go to madras or chennai and ask about the kuam it's become rather than a noun it's become an adjective for a drain right so this is a kuam could refer to any drain rather than the river itself and this is in turn led to a, the flowing river imaginary which is to say that there was a pristine past and a river that existed previously that always flowed that actually has not um has 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 not uh, today has not is not been able to flow because of certain engineering problems or certain settlement problems and what we do in this paper is to actually question the notion of the river and rather try and put the kuam forward as an estuary as a marsh as a tank of many kinds of water bodies that were an amalgamation rather than a singular um, idea of a flowing river and this in turn including karuna nidhi but also tyagaraya chetty almost every political leader in madras city has been obsessed with cl- cleaning the kuam river and this cleaning has therefore perpetuated the idea of a river both as aesthetic but also as engineering right and so we're trying to try and deconstruct this kind of imagination of the flowing river in different ways and finally um we can't then think about uh this idea of the flowing river uh, with the banks of the kuam which were inhabited by the urban poor and it was these common lands that are also or porambok lands that are also a category of our investigation i'll stop there thank you uh wonderful thank you so much aditya and and um please send our thank yous to bavani as well um we now have about uh, i think it's like 35 minutes or so we've got some time to do some q and a so um the first question i think that i'll i'll toss out and before i even toss out the first question um i should say that uh if you have questions please do send them in through the the q and a box and then i'll do my best to kind of fish them out and um and pass them to the appropriate um person oh and we've got uh, arti back too so this is lovely uh, um but um i will then distribute the questions as they come in um and i've got a few of my own as well but let's just kick it off with this one question from uh ishani uh sarma who's asking a question uh, to you sujit it's it's a it's a kind of comparative question um, and really it's more of a re- i think um ishna is asking for your reflections really your kind of comparative thoughts so um the making of kind of colombo port city reminds uh this person of lamu in kenya um again you know a place within within the british indian ocean for sure um lamu is an old city it's going through these changes in terms of chinese investment um and how it's kind of transform in the cityscape um land water and, and the people as well within the community there and so um i'm turning it into a, an economic zone and i guess what ishna is curious about is just if you could offer any reflections on on this kind of two different sites of the indian ocean and and having this kind of history port city but also now more recently kind of chinese investment if there's anything that you can share on that uh yeah thank you for the question um um i i don't think i can see the question but anyway um i haven't worked in lamu so i can't answer directly i mean to be I'm totally honest um so in some ways i can't give you a detailed um comparison of the two sites but of course certainly what's going on at colombo um and china is happening uh, more generally uh in the indian ocean world i guess just from what i work on um i would say that certainly there might be parallels between sites like this 
but we need to be conscious really of environmental context as well as the long history, which is specific in this particular case. Because um, and I'm not saying, I mean, I'm sure there are other places like it, but that in a sense, we need to factor that into any comparison that we mount. So the fact about Colombo is that it's multiply layered in the sense that it was first an Islamic settlement um, which uh, was used by um, various trading communities. Then it was a Portuguese um, co uh, colonial settlement. Then it was a Dutch and then it was a British. And now, um, you know, it's been um, uh, financed by China, but also it's a sort of site of, uh, picking up Aditya's last point of a sort of, hy you know, hygienic, hy hygienist, uh, ultranationalism at various points um, as well has operated in this place. So that's a sort of pathway which is quite particular. There might be other sites like it, but I think we need to kind of keep that in view. And in addition that it's a particular geography, I was quite struck by that, again, listening to the wonderful comments of Aditya that, and uh, Bhavani as well, that here it's a wetland geography and so Madras certainly is this beachland. And we've got to kind of keep, really keep in mind the specific geographies that we're working on. Um, certainly comparisons might be useful, but I think we need to sort of keep the material dimensions uh, in view um, as well. So sorry not to answer in more detail, but I think, yeah, that would be a kind of starting tape with that question. No, that's that's great. And I think it's it's wonderful that you bring that back, that really the water here matters, the ecology here matters. And um, and we need to be sort of, as you say, mind, mindful of that. Um, let's go to another question. This is from Gretchen, and this is to Aditya and Bhavani. It's a question about the, the koam. So um, Gretchen's wondering, was the koam originally a tidal wetland and slow? And, and this is what it, it seems was implied, um, Gretchen is saying in Bhavani's um, part of her presentation. So maybe Aditya, if you want to speak to a little bit about the, um, a little bit about the, the nature of, of the koam. Thanks. Um... Um, thank you, Gretchen, for that question. So I think this is what we're trying to disentangle a little bit. So I think, so if if I if I went back to my map, um, so where the Coam intersects with the sea seems to be some form of tidal wetland, right? So there's 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 two arms. Um, there's the island itself seems to be a kind of wetland. Um, so that it seems to be a tidal wetland there. But there are certain other parts of the Kuam which clearly are some form of a drainage system um, because they're so interconnected to other drainage systems from within the city um, that they do exist as, as a drainage system. Um, there are other parts of the Kuam which seem to almost be a standalone tanks, uh, which seasonally fill and then they deplete in other seasons. And then finally, even outside the limits of the city or what, you know, even in, in 17, late 1700s, uh, what Bhavani found was that certain parts of it were always flowing. So there were, but that those parts of it were parts of other river systems, um, that that per perennial river systems that existed um, outside the limits of the city. But th that imaginary was kind of transposed into the city itself, and that's really the process in which we, which we're trying to look at, and the ways in which um, you can kind of disentangle what is known as a river right now into multiple kinds of water bodies and wet natures, as this conference suggests. Mm. Uh, thanks so much for that, Aditya. Um, I, yes, and if, if, uh, if, you, if you presenters have questions as well, feel free to jump at any point. You can jump in and, and um, raise questions. I'm going to pitch one to Tim, though, really fast. Tim, I just, I, I think it's, it's, it's so interesting. I, I'm, you're talk about fresh water and these wells and the importance of certain wells. And I was just wondering about um, did the fresh water come from the wells, as in tapping the wells and digging, uh, or or what role did rivers play? Because I know that around 1819, there were quite a number of rivers in Singapore, maybe like more than perhaps any other kind of island of its size. So was the drinking water sourced from rivers and the wells, or mostly from the digging of wells? Uh, mostly from wells. Uh, at one point, there was a plan to develop a, a reservoir along the Kalang River, but that uh, kind of went away due to swampiness and other issues of trying to create, a, uh, in a sense, a lake or a, a, you know, a dam, a pond, a, a reservoir. And that never really uh, worked. That's why they had to go into the interior because of the geographic layout and the streams and what have you there, uh, where they could create the reservoirs that 
uh, were created. But the, the thing is with the wells, yeah, it seems that most people got their water from wells. And what's of interest is later in the story by the late uh, 19th century, when they do develop this piping system, there are then complaint. you know, they, they had inspectors that went around to check your well to make sure the water was drinkable. And uh, one of the problems is when they eventually flipped over to a piping system coming from McRitchie, the water was really bad because they had a lot of runoff from pig farms on the slopes of McRitchie, which you might want to think is not a good idea uh, you know, uh, after heavy rains. So there were people who complained and wrote in saying, wait, you make us drink this water and the well water, you know, you're saying we can't drink the well water because it's no good. And you're having us drink this piped water that's filled with shit, basically, mm -hmm. and making us ill. And so it, it, this was always a problem of this delivering of water. And so the public wells, there, were, there was a question I already answered just by typing it in about the famous water carts. The, uh, they would, there would be carts that went around town. You know, they'd fill it up with tanks and go around to various parts of, of the town. And this was a common uh, uh, occupation simply because of this difficulty of delivering the water. So the, the problem with the wells were brackish water, they were drying out, particularly after they deforested Singapore, uh, famously 90% of it gone. One of the problems was then uh, there was uh, a lot less uh, uh, water in the streams. And there was a lot you know, more environment, you know, ecological problems and environmental change. And that was another reason for the development of the reservoirs is they just didn't have uh, drinkable water uh, being mm -hmm. delivered. Great. Thank you, Tim. Um, Sujit, why don't you go ahead and ask your questions? You, you have, I think, two that you'd like to raise. Yeah, no, I really, really enjoyed this panel. It's going to be so useful um, for my thinking in lots of ways. Um, so, Tim, I, I've worked on the Ross uh, map as well a little bit, actually, and I was, so it's really great. It was great to see it. Um, and I, I don't know if you've looked at the letters, of, which I'm sure you have, of J.T. Thompson, because it's really wonderful material there on water sure. as well. Um, so I'm just wondering how the, the kind of how sewage and drainage and tides actually kind of fit into, into this, because I guess from the survey, survey, surveying work of Thompson, it's very much that the laying of Singapore is actually about the, the management of water more wholesale in some ways. Oh, yeah. Um, yes. Uh, yeah. Thompson. So I just wondered, yeah, how the, in a sense, that, yeah, and how the kind of management of the sea and the sea face and, you know, all of this then fits into. Yes. So in a sense, is there a broad, is drinkable water as a category extractable? from actually water more wholesale as a system, which includes the sea, it includes drainage, it includes drinkable water as well. Mm -hmm. um, because it's fascinating thinking about drinking like this and also healthful, I mean, health being a kind of critical thing that people are concerned yes, with. Yes, well. yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, okay. And so with a lot of the, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's trying to, even with my own work, it's trying to find that balance between I'll, I'll say servicing the ships in the harbor and working that, you know, that, that coastal flow with the rivers. And there's two main rivers in Singapore that kind of meet near the downtown area. One is called the Singapore River and the much larger one's called the Kalan River. And uh, these two rivers become the key areas that things grow up. It does. I don't mean it just everything followed it. The Singapore River is actually not very, uh, it doesn't go very far inland. But uh, the Kalong River does go a bit of a ways in. And so it's really about managing, you're right, about managing that, that coastal area, how they develop it, getting the water to wherever the zone would be, you know, between brackish and fresh coming from inland. And so this is, you know, they want to be on the coast, but they also need to be where they can get the water in. And this is where it became a problem of engineering, of the piping. And the piping, there's a whole chapter eventually on the book on how screwed up the piping was because they could just never figure out or design it so they could get it from this main reservoir they first built into the town. And then how far into the town. And of course, it first was piped to the where the Westerners lived and they were like, oh, forget the Chinese. And it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa wait, that's our main population. We have to give them water. So it, it really is about this living near the water, managing this coastal area, and then also then managing this resource that ultimately for Singapore is coming from the middle of the island or inland, as particularly as the population grew and 
rain water and the wells weren't not going to support it. So, yes. Yeah, and can I ask my question for Aditya as well? Yes. Um, so Aditya, yeah, partly, could, I mean, that was really, really interesting and I'm gonna really benefit from your work and Babani's. I'm so glad to be you know, in a conversation going forward. Um, I guess I wondered partly because of the long history of Colombo, um, what the long politics of this might be, especially in relation to a kind of sacred politics of water in South India, partly because in, in the Sri Lankan context, there's all this work, for instance, on kingship and, um, um, you know, how it's about the land and the lakes in Kandy and so forth. But then I also think actually about the waterway between South India and Sri Lanka, you know, the passage, which has repeatedly, there have been attempts to deepen it, which I've written on in the early 19th century. But then there were attempts which led to strikes um, in our lifetimes as well in Delhi, right? And this whole idea of it being a sacred passageway uh, tied up with the Ramayana and so on and so forth, right? Because it's Adam's Bridge and Adam crossed this, this uh, set of islands um, across from South India to Sri Lanka, et cetera, et cetera. So there's, there's a whole series of st stories which are sacred connected to it. So I just wondered what, and that kind of picks up your last photograph as well, what the kind of sacred political significations of water are in a space like South India and how they feature then because in a sense, if the, one of the messages is that this is a, the creation of a drain where there isn't really a river, um, then how was water configured differently prior to that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I mean, it's a really, really interesting question. So I think Bhavani would be way better equipped to, to answer this, um, but I, I'll just, I'll answer it through, through one means and then I have a question as well. So. I think what one of the one of the key things that we've seen is that this kind of imaginary of the pure flowing river has actually come through a study of temples along the river. Um, so that's how this imaginary is, is continuously reinscribed. This is very present presentist, um, but much of this imagery has been constructed through the fact that temple ins inscriptions seem to suggest that at one point or another, and you know, temples have um, what is known as a kale, or, you know, it, there's a, there's a bar which says that as which tracks the height of water, how high water comes. So then the temple is basically for the village. It's kind of a reassurance that water won't come above that particular. So you don't build below that, below that bar, essentially. Um, so, through these temple bars, uh, but these temple bars and people have not taken them to be seasonal and so on. So, so the temp temple bars have been taken as a kind of um, idea that now the river has been flowing because there is a temple bar and therefore there was always water in this place. Um, one particular place, for instance, next to the case of Ramanikat, which is just now on the boundaries of Chennai city, um, we, where there exists a large temple, uh, which, you know, which, and there's a museum and so on right now. And there was an old um, battle there. I think it was in the 13th century uh, between, um, I'm forgetting the name of the kings, but I think Bhavani is the one who knows this. Uh, and this battle has now been, um, set, you know, it's it's called the Battle of the Kuam. Uh, it was supposedly a battle for the fresh waters of the river. And so that imaginary has been reinscribed now into present narratives for kind of reconstructing this river. But as such, we haven't worked yet on doing that work ourselves to try and understand what the pre, um, what the imaginary was prior to colonialism. Um, and I think hopefully that's something that uh, we will get to at some point. Um, I don't know if that fully answers your question, but in any case, I also have a question for you. Is that is it okay, Anthony, if I ask now, or should I hold off? Uh, no, no, go ahead. Yeah, that's okay. Um, so I I wanted to know. I mean, this this question of the dock workers and mill workers is something that is really is fascinating because the same uh, question emerges in Madras City as well. That the that dock workers and and mill workers uh, and the mill workers are are next to the Kuam. There's a mill next to the Kuam. The Bini Mills, uh, and and of course the harbor comes up at around 1905, and most uh, people from places like Chintadri Pet start to work in the harbor uh, post 1905. So I'm wondering if is there a kind of watery link there that you're able to build in 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 the case of Colombo? Uh, are these similar populations who are working in both the mills and, and the docks? Are they radically different? Is it fishermen population who are working the docks? Which tends to be the case in some some sometimes, whereas mill workers. So I'm just wondering how how you are dis disentangling that um, in the case of yeah. Rome. No, I think that's a really really good question. I mean, I need to know have more information. I mean, my basic kind of information at the moment, which I'm working with, 
is um, there is a significant proportion of, um, of Tamil communities um, and South Indian communities. The, the, the workers in the mill actually probably come from India. Um, and it is likely that the harbor workers could be also Tamil communities. Um, the petitions I've come across from the fishermen indicate that they could be Roman Catholic um, Tamil communities because the, the, the petitions come by are like local churches and things like this. So um, there could be a particular social structure operating here, which is also a migrant structure uh, of various kinds, which is seasonal, uh, which then picks up the story of indentured labor as well, which is also coming via these ports, right? Um, and so I would need to yeah, work in much more detail to try and figure out why these sorts of links are happening. But certainly there are also, I mean, the, the politics is led also by leftist Sinhalese uh, intellectuals in, in the 20th century. So it's not, yeah, it, it's more complicated, I think, in turn. By the way, the mill is run by a Koja merchant from Bombay as well uh, for a period, which again kind of indicates a really interesting history of capital coming from, um, um, from, from Bombay, um, stretching out. Uh, which is a story that we know from the port of Bombay as well. I also had a question for Arthi, actually, but um, I think... Yes, maybe... yes, uh, go ahead, Sujit. And then I think Chitra also has a question for Arthi, but you can you can go ahead. Yeah, no, I just was really fascinated. I, I unfortunately couldn't get all the details, Arthi, but of the way the fish are being... The, the life cycle of the, the fish and the management, in a sense, is this an interspecies um, argument is what I wanted to ask. And of course, there's been all this wonderful work recently most recently by Jonathan Saha, for instance, on Burma, Myanmar, um, but also Tamara Fernando, who's working on the pearl fishery. And I just wondered, um, in, uh, between India and Sri Lanka, um, yeah, how is this an interspecies perspective that you're adopting? And how are, the, you know, how are the fish being, can you say more about how the fish are being changed? Oh dear. Okay. Hi, Sujit. I'm going to try to uh, say this and I hope that you can hear me and not just some sort of strange sounds. Um, no, I'm not really adopting an interspecies perspective. Um, I, well, this, this chapter is really part of a broader thesis, right? And I think I rely a lot more on uh, Pierre Bourdieu's uh, approach because I'm trying to look at the reproduction of certain fisheries practices uh, over a period of time. So, and I find that his thesis and uh, allows for that sort of um, story to be told, uh, particularly about why we end up doing certain practices even today in fishery science. And uh, for me, I, I find the interspecies approach not terribly helpful in this instance in, in terms of what it is that I'm trying to do. I think it is very useful uh, in other ways, but um, only if you are a little clear about what your project is about. So I, I don't, uh, I don't see the need to bring that in. Uh, I do think that you know there's there's some value to looking at fish as non-humans with some amount of agency, uh, but that needs to be qualified in ways that that is comprehensible to to the audience you're writing for, really. I hope you, you managed to hear all of that. No, thank you. I, I have, also I typed a uh, response to Chitra, really, because... I yeah, why don't you go at it? Can hear. We've got a good connection. If you want to go and go ahead and answer... Mm -hmm. um, yes, uh, Arti, you can answer um, Chitra's question. Chitra? Yeah, okay, I'll try. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah I, I think that, uh, you know, as I said, this um, how this this colonial resource regime continues into the contemporary scientific field. Uh, again, as I said, I, I find the Bourdieu's theory like extremely fascinating, uh, and then to it, I think we can append a lot of um, you know learnings and concepts from the science studies, such as the attention to objects and non-humans and and what that brings. Um, so I feel like. So because my thesis broadly looks at how the broader field itself came to be, uh, I need to pay more attention to, you know, all of the range of the, the concepts that Bourdieu leaves us with, right? Like habitus and capital and, uh, and so on, uh, which offers a better explanation as to why certain practices tend to be privileged to this day, even though they fail uh, to provide 
facts that are you know durable but yet we continue to persist in uh, pursuing those um, such as fish stock assessments uh, doing this is terribly expensive it's it's highly unreliable and so on but but why is it that uh, you know so would you ask this question right yes this is a whole like indeterminate world and so on but there are some things that endure and why do we continue to invest in those things so i, I think my thesis follows that question rather than the highlighting how everything is fluid there are some things that are just like rock solid and you can't dislodge them right and so maybe that's why he has a good explanation for that i feel very good uh, thank god i managed thank god <laughs> Yes, you did. You 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 got, uh, and I think that also probably covered the conclusion of your your presentation as well. So thank you so much yes. for for sharing. Yes. Um, I've thank got a, you. Thanks very much. Yeah. Thanks, Arti. I've got a question for Tim. Tim, I'm curious about the role that place names figure in trying to reconstruct that early history of freshwater mm -hmm. place names. So. Um, well, a, a lot of it, excuse me, with, you know, I put the thing where they built the, the public wells and like Kampong Malacca, or, uh, I mean, Tilo Ayer is currently a district in Singapore and, and such, but some of them you can just, uh, that's just a matter of having to do, you know, there's very good resources available to us that do Singaporean history. And you can find through maps and the archives and various other things that goes back you can find some of these places. But yeah, they, they often are talking about, oh, they dug a well here, they dug a well there. And uh, the landscape is, you know, in other words, there's still a Fort Canning Hill and there's a lot of the landscape and uh, place names, road names and such still like Saligi Road, which was one of the places a well was dug, still remain. But you just have to think about, you know, sometimes the maps have changed a bit, and the, the routes and things. But a lot of it, I really have to say, it's not necessarily me, but it's uh, the archives and other resources. You can type these things in because sometimes I'm like, where the hell is that? And you'll type it in. Oh, there it is. Oh, that's where it is. Or there used to be a street there or that, things like that. So it just works out. And so I'm not going to say any uh, great knowledge on my behalf, but just the, the wealth of other people contributing to it. Great. Um, let's see, Aditya, do you have a, thanks for, thanks for answering that, uh, Tim. Um, Aditya, do you have a question? Your hand's up, it looks like. Oh, you're on mute, though. I do, but I mean, I'm happy to just wait for other people. Um, I can always ask the panelists later. Um, I no, no, no. I think w this is a conference about water, so we're very fluid. You you go for it. Um, okay, so, so I'm... I actually see a question from Sumitra Nair in the right. in the Q and A, yeah. so maybe I'll answer that very briefly and then ask a question as well. Is that okay? That sounds great. Okay. Um. So uh, thanks, Sumitra, for this question. I think it's a really interesting question. So this aesthetic question is something that we're kind of dealing with in in different ways. I mean, um, initially, you know, as you as you kind of as you rightly point out, so there are these pristine landscape images that. Um, come up in the 1850s or so, uh, and you keep, and, and they're watercolor paintings and so on. But you lose that for around 20, 30 years, then you don't get much of those kind of watercolor paintings and, and bridges. And so there's there's a shifting of the aesthetic there. You don't you don't get these pictures of the Kuom anymore. And instead, what you get eventually is that racialized image of um, that Brahmin man who's holding his nose um, next to the Kuom, which signifies multiple things, right? Uh, and and there's, there's layers that we one can unpack there. Um, but eventually, I think it, by the 1950s, 1960s, it becomes very clearly a kind of aesthetic project uh, where it becomes, you know, eventually it becomes part of what is known as the Singara Chennai um, project. And, a, and Singara Chennai means beautiful Chennai uh, and river restoration and so on. And so I think uh, at the moment, we don't have any reference to the aesthetic imagination before these engineering interventions, but this is kind of continuously um, happening. And, and there's a huge change within 100, 200 years of this aesthetic imaginary. I don't know if that answers your question. And very quickly uh, to Sujit again, I, sorry, I was just really, I think that so many kind of connections between um, the, the work that we're doing. 
And so I had a question about um, the housing settlements of whether you've been able to find, because, I mean, I asked that question because, you know, what we're finding on the banks of the Kuam, which you might see again for, for mill workers um, in the canals that you're working on in Colombo, is that there's a distinct kind of making of the commons or, you know, occupation of land in different forms. And it happens only on the banks of the water bodies, but also there's simultaneously next to the harbor, there's also a different kind of making of occupation, which seems to have a lot more um, political power rather than the ones who settle on the canals. And we're trying to basically disentangle why this political power is far more in one case uh, and less less than another. And I'm wondering if you just see parallels or, or differences. Yeah, uh, no, that's again, um, a really good question. I mean, so basically with the uh, Kirill Kana stroke, well about the canal, which is the one I spoke on for the second half of the paper. Uh, and I don't know if you remember that the last one of the images I showed was of that high rise block coming up, which I walked through actually recently. And it's only recently that that, ha that has happened um in the last 10 or so years and so what we've had is over this very long period from the installment of those mills people being actually tied this housing um surrounds so there's a sort of very um it's a sort of they, they can't for the for the because of financial circumstances and because of the way they're paid and so forth they're kind of tied in to this pattern of housing from which they can't move out so um in a sense yes the housing is connected to the mill and in, is connected to a regime of work uh, meanwhile, what I'm finding is that there are various sort of children in the 19th century in, in homes who are also working in this mill. Um, so in a sense, there's a sort of whole complex really of work, land, um, and an environmental context of, yes, certainly uh, living um, in a, an area which then by the water, which is becoming increasingly polluted. Uh, there are complaints about um, temperature in the mills. There's complaints about noise. Um, of uh, lack of safety. It's also an area which I'm discovering um, is central to the building of roads uh, because it's at the place where rocks are being blasted uh, in order to build most of the roads of Colombo. And so you're getting complaints and what I found was huge numbers of petitions about flying pieces of rock landing on people's roofs, for instance. So it's, you know, that is that is that is that aspect of it. Um, along the harbour, I mean, something again very interesting is happening. It's dramatically changing. I mean, the building I visited with an activist a few weeks ago is now no longer standing uh, in the area uh, which is still called Slave Island. So that indicates really the prior history of the of the, of the area around this, the Bear Lake, which I mentioned, which is more more central, to, like in north north uh, towards uh, uh, the old centre of the city. Um, so the history of that is that it goes from being certainly you know enslavement to Malay communities, to a working class neighborhood. And now it's being bulldozed as well. So it's it's a different kind of, it's a similar symmetric, but a different kind of pathway. Um, so in some ways it might, but again, I need to do a huge amount of research to actually back this up, but it's uh, it speaks well to your, your point. Thanks very much, um, Sujit. And that was a great question, Aditya. I've got a question maybe for all of you, which which I think each of your projects sort of um, um, do this. And, and, and that is, you know, folks who do ocean work often just think about the ocean. Um, folks who do freshwater work often just kind of stay in freshwater. And all of your, your, your projects, your papers, um, they are really crossing different kinds of salinities. They're crossing different kinds of ecologies. Um, and they're crossing different kinds of infrastructures. And I was just curious if you could share a little bit about, about your method or your process or maybe some sort of how you navigate that. Because, uh, you know, you Google oceanic history and, and the river doesn't usually figure into it um, um, or, or some kind of fresh water. Or if you look at the kind of scholarship that's on rivers, it, anything about the shoreline or the ocean doesn't um, figure in. But you all are sort of really wrestling, I think, in different ways and in, at sort of different levels um, that fluidity. So if you could just speak to the process and maybe some of the, the ways in which you navigate that. Um, and I, I mean, who goes first is, is up to you all. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll go first. I'll just jump in since I'm here in Singapore and this is based in Singapore. Uh, basically, I just start all of my research for this project on, the, on that basic question of where do you get a glass of water? And so it's in a sense of going through the archives, going through, you know, trying to, you know, look keywords like water, wells, reservoir, piping uh, and, and, and such. And so 
it's just kind of chasing down those words because it's, you know, it's, it's not like they dedicate a lot of material on this. Uh, you know, we don't often think about where we get our water, uh, drinking water from, uh, or they don't write it up a lot, particularly in the 19th century. And so it's just, uh, and so that's why also it'll appear that there's a lot of problems because the only time they write about it is when there is a problem. Mm -hmm. But it's that, I'll, I'll say basically that it's almost a keyword search when you're going through archives and things. Now, that means, you know, whatever the type of resource it actually, or uh, uh, whether it's a, uh, you know, archival source or newspapers or whatever it might be, uh, that's where I begin. So mm -hmm. I'll just leave it at that. Great. Thanks, uh, Tim. Um, maybe uh, Ditya or Sujit, if you wanted to share. Well, or Arti could well. Yeah, Arti could also. RT, are you able to? Um, yeah, I mean, just one little thing to say that, you know, looking for this kind of material, I mean, there's something to be said about how, you know, trying to look for these stories in the archives is already a kind of structured hunt. And um, particularly if you have limited resources and, and you're trying to tell a coherent story. So you sort of end up uh, following traces of a certain kind. So much as you may want to bring in many streams, I think you are led along these paths. So yeah, perhaps uh, th that's something that strikes me that you, know, you, you, you have to look for these things with very specific keywords. And so they have their own agency no? in that yeah. way. <laughs> They control your story then. Maybe just to, to draw a link between Tim and you, Arthi, but then we can go to maybe Aditya and then Sujit. Tim, you're starting, you're kind of following fresh water. And I, I saw in, in Arthi's presentation, the Hilsa. And the Hilsa is one of these kind of trans-aquatic types of fish that is freshwater estuary and ocean. So I, you know, Arthi, I think if, in you following that fish, you're crossing those different kinds of salinities as well, which is, um, you know, methodologically quite kind of, I think, innovative. Yeah, so well done. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure what they, yes, that's all true. <laughs> right, yes. Uh, Sorry, then, I'm yeah, not uh, sure I heard what you were saying. I was um, celebrating your method, uh, Artia, uh, by following the Hilsa as one of the examples. Um, Aditya, how about you? And then we can go to Sujit, just in terms of, you know, what it, what it means to navigate these different things. I think, you know, actually, that's a really good question because we actually started thinking about this project through thinking about different sites. Um, we didn't envision it, which we should have possibly, we didn't envision it as, as thinking about different kinds of waters, but we actually started with different kinds of sites. Um, so the harbor was one site, um, the Kuam was another, and, you know, the, the suburb of um, Tinagar was another, um, but we, sub and then when we started doing the research, we said, oh, these are interesting sites, let's just start from here. But when we started doing the research, actually, we found that they were all interconnected to each other. Either there were the same characters who were involved in many of these improvement urban schemes, um, or it was actually that water was flowing across boundaries. So I think now what we're trying to do is that we're trying to follow water. But the problem with following water is that you, you, you have to stop somewhere that you know somewhere the, the flows are so interconnected that it doesn't stop at any point so at some point we have to say okay th this is what this is where we're going to stop because actually then the kuom is in real interconnected to a much broader bigger river system that that's far beyond the city and so on so that's not something so we have to find the limits as well so i think that's what we are doing at the moment. for sure yeah that's th thank you um, Sujit, did you want to maybe say? Yeah, no, yeah, no, thanks. Yeah, I, I kind of follow on from that, really, in the sense that, yeah, I mean, of course, one can follow water, and then one goes from oceans to rivers, one goes from uh, rivers to canals, um, and so on, and it kind of becomes an unending kind of um, set of questions and um, pathways that you follow. And I think that's right in many ways, because, you know, water is, as you've said, in um, is fluid, and so it's important to have a kind of wide view of it. Um, and canals are determined on the basis of reefs, as I was mentioning earlier. Um, uh, complexes of maritime commerce move in land, which of course, you know, uh, they've done um, in the 19th century, right across the Bay of Bengal, uh, et cetera. But I guess it is interesting at the same time to think about water events, 
So in the sense of we need more work on, you know, the monsoon and what's, what it's doing here or a flood event, um, really, and what it means. And this is also another way. Of, so in a sense, rather than approaching it via what is the relationship between a river and, and an ocean, we could approach it differently like that. And of course, there is work um, in that space, too. And then the kind of really good point um, that's made that, you know, what a river is and how it's defined and how it becomes a river. So not to assume that water is a self-evident thing. Um, but that there are processes really of definition at work here, which need to be, um, yeah, really considered uh, and how, you know, things move over time from one thing to another in terms of um, being a drain or being a set of marshes or whatever it might be too. Yeah, so that would be my answer really. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and definitely the changing nature of water, as you said, sort of from, from, from wetland to something else or the, the changing social nature, um, whether it's a canal or, or um, a kind of polluted maybe backwater or something like that. I mean, just from all of your talks, and I, I think we're just at our time. I, I just wanted to say though, all of your talks, you know, you're following different kinds of water into social spaces and social conflict or public health or urban development or the law um, and, and facts. And uh, so you're already taking, I think, water into some very interesting directions. Um, and in many ways, you know, not uh, being, having the salinity of the water, not really needing to be so much the element, but where can wadi water take you and, and what it connects you to, I think is quite nice. Um, Chitra, I think, are we out of time? Is this panel pow, as they would yes. say in Hawaii? <laughs> Yes, it's, it's, we are out of time. Okay, fabulous. Thank you all so much. Arthi, Sujit, Aditya, Tim, and Bhavani, thank you for sharing. Thank you for taking the time. I mean, thank you for being part of this, uh, this experience. So um, um, uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you for bringing it together. It's been a really good conversation. Thank you, Chitra. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you so much yeah. for having us. so much, here. everybody. Thank I you. I hope to see you tomorrow. Um, so that's, um, that's the end of the panel, but it double X is also the end of today, day one. Um, so we will resume again tomorrow at 10. Is that correct, Chitra? Yeah, tomorrow at 10. Um, we've got two panels tomorrow and then um, and then it's the weekend here in Singapore. So, uh, you know, find your partner and go pair up and do something because you can only do things in pairs. <laughs> That's the max. <laughs> so, but that aside, um, it was really a wonderful day. I appreciate all the time again, um, Chitra. This has been fun and I will see you tomorrow. Yeah, see you all tomorrow. Um, and I'm really looking forward to my presentation. So I can so show you guys what I'm doing too. That's right. Thanks again. Thank you, everybody. Bye.